Hi everyone, this lesson is on an approach to determining the cause of chronic diarrhea. So this is a continuation of my previous lesson on an approach to acute diarrhea. So we're going to first talk about what chronic diarrhea is. So we have to first define what diarrhea is. There are actually three definitions for diarrhea. The first one involves any increased frequency of bowel movements or decreased consistency of stool in a 24 hour time period. So increased frequency meaning going to the washroom and having more bowel movements than usual, more than your baseline, or having a decreased consistency of stool in that the stool is softer or watery. And this occurs in a 24-hour time period. The second definition involves a more quantitative approach. This definition involves at least 200 grams of dry weight of stool per day. And the third definition of diarrhea is at least three bowel movements per day. So these are the three different definitions of diarrhea and they can be used for different purposes. Oftentimes, what will more likely to be used is the first definition. Now diarrhea can be further defined into acute diarrhea and chronic diarrhea. And it's going to be determined by how long an individual has had diarrhea. Acute diarrhea occurs for less than two weeks. And chronic diarrhea occurs for more than two to four weeks. So some definitions will state that it's more than two weeks. Some definitions will state that it's more than four weeks. And in the case where chronic diarrhea is defined as more than four weeks, oftentimes that period between acute and chronic diarrhea, that two to four week time period, would be considered subacute, the subacute period. The reason why we want to define acute and chronic diarrhea is because this helps us determine the cause of the diarrhea. If it is acute diarrhea, it is most often going to be infectious in nature, although it could be the beginning of a chronic diarrhea, as we may not know because we may not have been past that two-week time period. And then with chronic diarrhea, it's more likely to be a chronic medical condition. And more specifically, it's going to be non-infectious. So we're going to get into all of the medical conditions that cause chronic diarrhea. If you want more information on the causes of acute diarrhea, please check out my full lesson on approach to acute diarrhea. Now, it's important when trying to determine the cause of a chronic diarrhea, we have to look at many different factors in the patient's life. Some of these are going to include family history. So if there's any family history of medical conditions that cause chronic diarrhea, it's important to make note of those. It's also important to know the past medical history of the patient. If there's any recent hospitalizations, the symptom course of the chronic diarrhea, and we're going to talk a bit more about this in more detail in the next slide. It's also important to note some associated symptoms. These can include joint pain or skin findings, and these can help determine the medical condition that is causing the chronic diarrhea. It's also important to note any food sensitivities, any medication use. Some medications can cause chronic diarrhea, and we're going to talk about those in this lesson as well. And then even travel. So although I mentioned that chronic diarrhea is going to most often be non-infectious in nature, some infections can last more than two to four weeks. So these are often going to be related to travel or sick contacts. So it's important to also think about travel and sick contacts because an infection could be causing chronic diarrhea. And we're going to talk about those infections later on in this lesson. Let's get into more specific details as to the signs and symptoms and associated symptoms of chronic diarrhea. So we mentioned before the definitions of diarrhea, but there are going to be some particular findings with regards to the diarrhea itself. So with diarrhea, there's going to be abdominal pain and cramps. It's important to note the characteristic of the stool. Is it watery or non-watery? Or is it bloody or non-bloody? And these are going to help us determine the cause of the chronic diarrhea. And then it's also important to make note whether the diarrhea occurs with or without eating. And then it's also important to think about other symptoms that may be associated with nutrient deficiencies as some medical conditions cause chronic diarrhea and also cause nutrient deficiencies. So there are actually multiple categories of causes of chronic diarrhea. These are the categories of causes. One is known as secretory. Another one is osmotic. Another one is functional. Another one is inflammatory. And another one is malabsorptive. So we're not going to talk about all the specific details with regards to each of these categories, but we're going to get into a lot of detail, especially in the next upcoming slides, as to the different causes that fall within each of the categories. Now, each of these category of causes has particular and more specific symptoms that occur. For instance, if the chronic diarrhea is secretory in nature, it is a watery diarrhea. And a key finding with regards to secretory diarrhea is it occurs with and without food. So it doesn't matter if a patient is eating or not eating. They can go a long time without eating, but they can still have diarrhea. This is going to be a finding with regards to secretory causes of chronic diarrhea. 
And then because of this, because it can occur without food, it can also occur at night. It can wake the patient up from sleep. So there are nocturnal symptoms. Now, in contrast to the secretory causes, the osmotic causes of chronic diarrhea are going to have also watery diarrhea, but they're not going to have the nocturnal symptoms and they're not going to occur without food. So it's going to occur after someone has eaten something. So that is going to be the findings with regards to osmotic causes of chronic diarrhea. Now, the functional causes of chronic diarrhea are also going to have watery diarrhea, but they can also have some other gastrointestinal symptoms, including constipation. And oftentimes these can fluctuate, they can alternate. And so a patient may alternate between constipation and diarrhea. And what is noted with functional causes of chronic diarrhea is that the gastrointestinal symptoms are oftentimes going to be diet and stressor related. So if there are particular foods or beverages that a patient may be eating, or if they're having increased stress in their life, then this can actually increase or worsen the symptoms of the functional causes of chronic diarrhea. And then what's noted with functional causes of chronic diarrhea is that the symptoms improve at night and with fasting. Now in inflammatory causes, this can either lead to watery or bloody diarrhea. So bloody diarrhea is important to note here because if you see bloody diarrhea, this helps you narrow and focus into the inflammatory causes. And we're also more likely to see nutrient deficiencies as well, although some nutrient deficiencies can occur in some of these other categories, but we're more going to see it in the inflammatory and malabsorptive causes. And then if there is any laboratory testing done, such as looking for fecal calprotectin, fecal calprotectin is actually going to be present and this is going to help determine whether this is an inflammatory cause of chronic diarrhea. And then in the malabsorptive causes, we are again going to see water diarrhea, and we're also going to see steatorrhea, so fatty stool, and we can also see nutrient deficiencies as well. So there are a few differences in the signs and symptoms between each of these categories of causes that can help us determine what the cause might be. And one other thing I didn't mention is that joint pain may be an extra associated symptom with regards to inflammatory causes. We're going to talk a bit more about the associated symptoms with each cause in each of these categories in the next upcoming slides. Now let's talk about the causes of chronic diarrhea in the categories of secretory, osmotic, and functional. So secretory causes of chronic diarrhea include the following. Medications. So medications including stimulant laxatives. So if stimulant laxatives are used for weeks, this can lead to a secretory chronic diarrhea. Some others include the antibiotic amoxiclav or amoxicillin clavulonate. Colchicine, the medication used for gout, can also cause a secretory chronic diarrhea. We can also see quinine and calcitonin being causes as well. Addison's disease, which is adrenal insufficiency, this can lead to a secretory chronic diarrhea as well. Hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism can be a cause of chronic diarrhea because it increases gastrointestinal or GI motility. Some other conditions that can be a cause of secretory chronic diarrhea include vasculitis. And vasculitis is vascular inflammation. So there's vasculitis or vascular inflammation within the gastrointestinal system. This can cause secretory diarrhea. And then some other causes include alcoholism, post-surgical, and neuroendocrine tumors. Within the category of osmotic, we also see some medications. Now these are going to be osmotic laxatives and metformin. Metformin can lead to an osmotic chronic diarrhea. Lactose intolerance can also be a cause. So in the case of lactose intolerance, this causes osmotic diarrhea because the lactose is not being digested properly in patients who have lactose intolerance. So that lactose is going to enter into the large intestine and it's going to draw water toward it. It's going to cause osmosis of water. So it's osmotic. And that's the reason why we see lactose intolerance being a cause within the osmotic category. And we're going to get this from consumption of dairy products. Fructose intolerance is another one. Again, we can see this from eating fruits or especially high fructose corn syrup. And for similar reasons, because it's not being digested and absorbed properly, it's going to enter into the large intestine undigested and unabsorbed, and that's going to lead to water flowing toward it. And then high consumption of sugar alcohols can also be another cause within the osmotic category. And these are going to be sorbitol and xylitol, those types of sugar alcohols. And an example of high consumption of sugar alcohols may be from chewing gum. So sugar-free gum, if an individual chews a lot of sugar-free gum, they're actually ingesting or could ingest a lot of sugar alcohols. Those sugar alcohols can then enter into the large intestine and they draw water toward them as well. And this can lead to diarrhea. 
And then the cause within the functional category is going to be irritable bowel syndrome. And the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome are going to be triggered by a variety of dietary and stress-related factors. And some other factors that can trigger symptoms include changes in hormone levels that can occur during the menstrual cycle. And then the other two categories of causes are inflammatory and malabsorptive. So the causes in the inflammatory category include Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is going to involve inflammation throughout the entire gastrointestinal tract. So inflammation can occur anywhere from the mouth all the way through the gastrointestinal tract to the rectum. Another one is going to be ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis is going to be inflammation within the colon. And each of these is going to have different sets of associated signs and symptoms as well. So with regards to Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, there can be some skin findings, there can be some eye findings, and there can be some joint findings as well. And if you want more information on the signs and symptoms of each of these, please check out my lessons on those topics. With regards to each of these though, it's important to note that with regards to ulcerative colitis, it's going to be a bloody diarrhea. And with regards to Crohn's disease, it's going to be water diarrhea most often. Diverticulitis is also going to be a cause within the inflammatory category. So this is where there's inflamed diverticula, which can lead to a variety of changes in bowel habits, can lead to bleeding, it can lead to feelings of urinary urgency and frequency and dysuria. If you want more information on diverticulitis, please check out my full lessons on those topics. Ischemic bowel can also be a cause within the inflammatory category. Tuberculosis, so intestinal TB can be a cause as well. Radiation colitis, so radiation colitis, inflammation in the colon due to radiotherapy. And another important cause within the inflammatory category is Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile is a bacteria, it's an infection, and it's going to be related to antibiotic use. Now, we mentioned before that infections, oftentimes the infectious causes are going to be acute diarrhea. This can cause acute diarrhea, but some patients can have long-lasting issues with Clostridium difficile, so this can lead to a chronic diarrhea as well. And then some gastrointestinal cancers can also lead to chronic diarrhea, and these can include colorectal cancer. And some other infections that can be causes within the inflammatory category include viruses like cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex virus. And then in the category of malabsorptive, these include chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis is where there is going to be decreased pancreatic enzyme production and release. So pancreatic enzymes are used to help digest fats and proteins. And if they're not around, those fats and proteins are going to not be digested and not going to be absorbed. And they're going to enter into the large intestine and then water is going to flow toward them and cause diarrhea. Celiac disease is another cause within the malabsorptive category. It's an autoimmune condition due to gluten sensitivity. Lactose intolerance can also be a cause within the malabsorptive category. So it can be categorized as both malabsorptive and osmotic. Chronic cholestasis is another cause within the malabsorptive category, and this is where there's reduced secretion of bile. Bile helps to emulsify fat to help digest and absorb that fat. If it's not released, if there's a reduced secretion of bile, there's going to be reduced fat absorption. This is going to cause malabsorptive issues. It can cause steatorrhea. And then certain infections that are chronic and long-lasting, and this includes Giardia lamblia, which is a protozoal infection that can be acquired during camping. And it's often from consumption of contaminated water. So beaver water, it's also known as beaver fever. If you want more information on that, please check out that lesson on Giardia lamblia. And then some other conditions within the malabsorptive category include amyloidosis, and then some other infectious processes, including Whipple disease and tropical sprue. So as you can see, not all causes fit nicely into each category. Each cause may have certain elements of each category, but these are going to be a general way of looking at which cause is in which category. And I mentioned quite a few causes here, but I haven't mentioned all of them. So again, there are even more within each category. If you want to learn more on acute diarrhea, please check out my lesson on approach to acute diarrhea. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time.